Hey guys, it's your pal Victor here and welcome to an all new end of the year edition rebirth renewal rising from the ashes of the Phoenix here in Phoenix, Arizona edition of cult following the official podcast from the people who bring you cult classics every month at the landmark Scottsdale quarter theater. I am your pal Victor here. Uh, this is a solo edition uh, and it's sort of a relaunch because we haven't done an edition of cult following in quite some time and I feel like it's due uh it's the end of 2022 this has been a big year for cult classics for cult classics uh and we haven't done any uh long form media since we've relaunched cult classics uh we we had this was a big year for us because uh starting in March 2022 we started doing live events again, and we have been pretty much not doing any live podcasts, uh, taped podcasts, uh, since before the pandemic in 2020. So this has been a bit of a break. Uh, so you might be surprised to see this in your feed. All I can say is if you enjoy movie commentary, thoughts on pop culture, uh, thoughts on film, and thoughts on the local AZ horror and film community. I invite you to keep this in your thread. Check this out. Like us on SoundCloud. Like us on YouTube. Like us on Spotify and wherever fine podcasts are bought and sold. We, we plan to make this a regular edition and get some of our cohorts in here and get it going again. This is also going to be a video podcast first and foremost right now. Uh, so you can find us on YouTube slash at sign cult classics and the video of uh, the audio feed will be on our SoundCloud and on all our other channels, including cultfollowing.co and cultclassicsaz.com. Um, just for some general, uh, cleanup notes, I will tell you that, uh, we do have a lot of events coming up in 2023. So let me get the shills out of the way. Uh, we will be doing another cult classic screening on January 21st. Uh, that will be Mandy directed by Panos Cosmatos. We'll be talking about that a little bit. And um, we will also be doing in the night before that, another edition of our Cinema Pantheon series. We'll be talking about that too. If you don't know what that is, you're gonna learn about it right here. Uh, this will be our second. And uh, We'll also be doing Monster Market on January 29th. And if you don't know what Monster Market is, we'll tell you about that also on this podcast. So we're going to get a few things out of the way right now. Uh, I'll tell you right now, today is December 29th as I'm taping this. And today was a big day in terms of climactic, sad events in the world of film. And we're going to talk about... This is, the, this is going to be the main crux of this episode. Today on Coke Following, I'm going to be talking about Italian horror movies. Italian horror movies. Why are you talking about that, Victor? Well, I'll tell you. Last night, me, uh, Jasperino from 700 Tapes, check out that podcast. Uh, Ruby from Art of Cult and our friend Jake, who does a lot of our shirt printing. The Cult Classics crew, if you will, Triple C, all up in the AZ. That's right, I just made that up on the spot. Uh, we went to the Arizona Italian Club. Uh, this is on 12th Street, uh, up by Bethany Home Road. So it's sort of like North Central Phoenix. And um, every Wednesday, they do an Italian spaghetti dinner. And uh, we had, we'd done this years ago, and then uh, they kind of stopped doing it. And I'll tell you, I love, I love spaghetti. You can talk to anybody out there. I love me some pasta. I love me some spaghetti westerns. And I love me some pasta. So we went out and they do an $11 pasta dinner on Wednesdays. I'm like, fuck it. We are cool Generation X loving uh, Italian food kids. We love the Ninja Turtles. We love Captain Lou and Super Mario Brothers Paisan. So we decided to go get this $11 pasta night. It was awesome. It was great. Uh, you, you cannot get a better value. And I will tell you, that got me thinking about Italian horror movies, all that stuff we love, you know, the Lucio Fulci zombie, La Via, the Beyond, uh, you know, City of the Living Dead, 
all that kind of stuff. So, you know, conversations start flowing. And then we wake up this Thursday morning to find out that Ruggiero Diodato, the director of Cannibal Holocaust, has sadly passed away at the age of 83. And I actually met Ruggiero Diodato uh, back in 2009 at the Creation Entertainment weekend of horrors an event that uh they tried to bring back but you can't capture the magic and it's funny i went to this edition and it's really sad how many people at this show are no longer with us i met toby hooper there i met Corey haim there i met uh graven creed there i met john saxon there i met ruggiero diodato there so that's five people at least at that show that are no longer with us um but i will tell you um i was there and the, that was the big get that year, that they had this whole Italian contingent there. They had Sergio Civelletti, who designed the Demon's Mask from the movie Demons, uh, for, you know, the, the early 80s Bava classic. Not Mario Bava, but you know who, and uh, his son. And then um, they also had uh, Claudio Simonetti, who did the, uh, the score for... Um, so many, you know, zombie Dawn of the Dead, the uh, Dario Argento version. He did the score for Suspiria. He did the score for um, Tenebra. Uh, and that was all before, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Goblin ended up splitting into two bands. Claudio Simonetti's Goblin and then Goblin. And this year we also lost Mauricio. So the official version of Goblin actually doesn't exist anymore. It's just Claudio Simonetti's Goblin, which is very sad, very sad. But I digress because I know you guys want to hear where I'm going with the story. So I was excited to meet Ruggiero Diodato because back then, i that's back in the early 2000s, man, when I first saw Cannibal Holocaust. It was not an easy movie to get still. I mean, I remember the first time I saw it was back in California. You know, you rent it from the shady place that you know the shady mom and pop where you like you know they have shocking asia and faces of death with a z you know all the all the really shady stuff that you weren't supposed to see this is back when if you wanted to see battle royal you had to watch it in 10 minute segments on youtube this was an actual period of time let me tell you so i will tell you i loved cannibal holocaust and when i first moved to uh Arizona, I got a chance to see a copy of Cannibal Holocaust on the big screen in 35 millimeter, and I was really excited. I made friends with the people who ran the screening at that time. Um, and one of the people, you know, we went there all as a group contingent from Arizona, you know, exciting. And I got to meet Ruggiero Diodato, who was speaking in Italian, not in English. And I was like, okay, it doesn't seem like we can really understand each other, but we did. We talked, there's a translator there. Nice enough fellow. I wish I'd gotten some stuff signed by him, but you know, you know, signatures, it's the experience, man. This is what I'll tell you folks, you lovely folks out there. If you can get the chance to meet someone famous, someone you admire, take it. Because you don't know if you'll get that chance again and you should totally take it. It's it's a great opportunity for you to meet your heroes. If it turns out they suck, you can jump into another fandom. But if you're really into somebody and then you're like, Victor, dude, I don't know. I'm too shy to meet them. Just take it. Take that chance. You know, um, I took that chance. And I remember talking to him through a translator who's a nice enough guy, very friendly, laugh, amiable. And I can tell you. Uh, this guy came up while we were talking, and he wanted to know his opinion on Umberto Lenzi, who directed another Italian horror movie called Cannibal Ferox. And I will tell you right now that Ruggiero Diodato has a lot, had a lot of reason to not like Umberto Lenzi, who passed away last year, I believe. Um, Umberto Lenzi directed this movie, Cannibal Ferox, which basically... If you know anything about Italian horror movies, my friends, is that they jump on a trend and they write it. They ride this trend and, uh, you know, it's spaghetti westerns, zombies, cannibals. And, uh, you know, Cannibal Ferox got a lot of negative attention and a lot of people began, you know, you know, 
thinking Camel Ferox and Camel Holocaust are the exact same thing, which they are not. But I, you can see how that would happen. They were both made in Italy. Uh, both involved cannibals. Both have the same leading man to a certain degree. Robert Kerman, who died a couple years ago, former porn star. He is a professor in Cannibal Holocaust. He's also one of the main guys in Cannibal Ferox. So this guy is like, oh, what do you think about Umberto Lenzi? I can tell you right now that just like many great wrestling promoters, Ruggiero Deodato, this man broke his gimmick. And what I mean that, the gimmick was that he was not a dude who spoke English. He did, because if you look on YouTube now, you'll see lots of interviews where he spoke English. And I will tell you, Ruggiero Deodato looked at this guy and he gave him the answer he wanted. He's like... Umberto Lenzi. I hate him. I hate him. So there you go. And then he laughed, you know, and then we all talked and it was fun. And that's like a fun anecdote that I love telling. And I can tell you, I had to share it today. I shared it on, on the Instagram. I shared it on Facebook. I shared it on some groups uh, run by friends, by people who were my friends back then. They didn't approve the post, but I will tell you they saw it. And I will tell you right now, man, that that was a great interaction with the world of Italian directing royalty in Diodato. I ended up going that night to the New Beverly Cinema to see uh, House on the Edge of the Park. And I sat across from... Um, um, before I said Graydon Creed, it was Graydon Clark. Graydon Creed is actually Sabretooth, some from the X-Men. Um, I sat across from, uh, you know, the, the, the main actor in that movie who passed away like a year or two later. And, you know, it's 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 just a fun memory. And I always loved the new Beverly, so I will give him a hat tip. I remember Brian Quinn was there. Well, I still think programs are along with my friend Phil Blankenship, so you could totally go to the new Beverly and check out the kind of awesome programming that you sh would see at any worldwide institution, like, uh, you know, the Prince, the Prince cinema in England, all kinds of great restoration, uh, programming, you know, restoration, you know what I mean? Um, revival programming. I won't, you know, that's it. Hey, I'm a human being. I'm bound to, bound to slip up here or there, but, um, I will tell you, uh, Italian horror, uh, it, it's something that a lot of people don't really, uh, have to dig for anymore because if you go on Shutter, you can find all this stuff. And I will tell you right now, if you get a chance to see this stuff, even on Shutter, go check it out. You can see all the great Fulci movies. Uh, there's lots of institutions that play great Giallo movies. Uh, I know Cinematic Void is even going to be here in Phoenix doing some cool stuff. Um, in 35 millimeter, I think uh, they just shipped out a, a print of Creepers um, that they'll be playing in town. You should Google that stuff. Great, great stuff. But I will tell you, if you can, check out The Beyond. Check out uh, Zombie. But because of Ruggiero Diodato, you should really go out of your way to check out Cannibal Holocaust. And I love this movie. I will tell you right now, Cannibal Holocaust... I will get shit on this. But dude, Cannibal Holocaust is a great movie. If you love the idea of found footage movies, uh, if you like meta movies, a social commentary, that is Cannibal Holocaust in a nutshell. It is an exploitation movie that is going after the whole idea of exploitation movies. It's so clever in that regard. It has well-drawn side characters. It has an interesting narrative device. It has a great, um, of its time, pacing. Like, the movie flows well, you know? And the, the, you know, the, the whodunit of what happened in the main characters in this movie is done really well. And then there's this whole thing about, oh my god, is this a snuff movie? And then when they go and watch a fake snuff movie, it turns out all the fake snuff movie is the only actual real death in the movie. And if you're afraid, because I know this movie has a transgressive reputation because of animal cruelty. And I do not advocate animal cruelty on any regard. And I will tell you right now, folks, straight up, there is real animal death in this movie. They kill a uh, small, like, uh, you know... Um, kind of a weasel type animal at the beginning and they kill a giant turtle um if you get 
the Grindhouse releasing cut version of Grind of uh, Cannibal Holocaust. Both the Blu-ray and the DVD feature a cruelty-free version, which you can watch it, and those scenes are skipped over. The movie works without that unnecessary gore. And I know Diodato got a lot of flack in his lifetime for this stuff. He went to trial in Italy, along with guys like Pier Paolo Pasolini, uh, who did the movie Salo or 120 Days of Sodom, because of just the level. They weren't on trial together, let me just tell you. Back then, people were afraid of transgressive NC-17-ish stuff, and people thought, oh my god, are these people dead? You don't believe me? There is a documentary series on Shudder called Cursed Films, and there's an entire episode about Cannibal Holocaust. So I highly recommend, if you get the chance, watch this film, then watch that episode. In that order, if you watch that episode, it completely spoils the film. Don't go into movies with this mind, like, where you're wikipedia everything beforehand. Don't. Just let the magic of film wash over you. And that's how you should experience things. Uh, let, like, turn the lights down. Uh, enjoy the moment. That's how you should experience film. Because film is a communal experience. That's what cult classics is all about. You go to a movie. You meet people. You share this experience. You take it in. You don't, like, de-analyze and, analyze and deconstruct something beforehand. Like, don't be a film hipster. And unfortunately, this is something we're going to have to talk about in a future episode because I think I feel like film hipsterism is really a bad thing. You shouldn't be trying to watch movies for the sake of watching movies. Like, you know, like, I know a lot of people love this idea of Hooptober. Like, oh, I need to watch X amount of movies this month and there has to be a gimmick to them. Dude, if that gets you into movies... It's totally fine. I won't knock the idea. But what I will tell you is I don't like this idea of like, oh, I got to watch X amount of movies in X amount of time because you're just consuming. You're not taking stuff in. There's places, there's times and places for that kind of thing. You go to a film festival, take shit in quickly. It's fun. And that's also a communal thing. You go to a movie marathon, also the thing. But you shouldn't do it at home. Do it at home. Do it with stuff you've already seen. But I don't like this idea of having stuff you've never seen in the background and acting like you have an opinion on it. Because you're not really fully consuming that movie. It's just passive entertainment. You're not getting the real film-going experience or the real thing unless you're taking something in. It needs to be something like Cinema Paradiso at its best or the Fangoria Entertainment movie Porno at its worst. Like, just consume it. Like, a movie like Cinema Paradiso, you need to see that on a big screen. It needs to make you cry. And if you don't cry watching Cinema Paradiso, you're fucking dead inside, man. That's all I'm telling you. All right, so I've gone on a, lot, on a little bit. But, like I said, your Dirty Dot is passing. Got me thinking about Italian horror. Those are my thoughts on Italian horror, and you should enjoy it. Check it out. It's great. Even when, like, the whole idea of, like, oh, my God, you know, there's uh, Dawn of the Dead. Let's just, the, the Italian version, Zombie, came out in Italy, and then suddenly there's Zombie, Zombie 2, Zombie 3, Zombie 4, all by Bruno Matti, which you can find from Severn Films. Dude, check that shit out, because even though it's churned out, it's churned out with love, you know? And it's great, and you should totally... Just see what people can do with this idea of zombies. Let's do a zombie in a plane crash. Do zombies, you know, in so many ways. And I know that uh, Lucio Fulci would have liked to not have his had as many zombies as he did in his films. But at a certain point, it's kind of hard to get away from what you're known for, you know. But even those, like the Beyond, wasn't meant to have zombies in it. But it was just like a producer issue. Like, okay, I know this is a Southern Gothic ghost story, but can you make some of those ghost zombies? I mean, I'm just telling you. And I won't spoil the Beyond for you, but you really need to see that movie in City of the Living Dead. You know, and House by the Cemetery. Those are all great movies. Check them out if you can. Most of them are on Shudder. Um, and like I said, I don't have a discount code for you, maybe one day, but I will tell you, 
Shutter is very inexpensive. If you get AMC Plus, you're getting a great deal, and you should that includes Shutter, and you can get all the shitty Walking Dead that you would want that will fill your life up, but you'd also get to see Interview with the Vampire, which is a really good show. And I'm actually also excited for the Mayfair Witches, which premieres in January. Uh, there's a lot coming up next year. So I'm going to get into topic two right now. Uh, and that topic is this. We're at the end of the year and we just had our Phoenix Film Critics Awards. And I will tell you, I'm a member of the Phoenix Film Critics Society. There's a couple of film groups in town. There's Phoenix Critics Circle. I'm part of PFC, PFCS. And we just had our awards and the major sweep winner in those awards was everything everywhere all at once and i will tell you right now i'm very happy about that i really like that movie and um one of the things i'm excited about is everything everywhere everything everywhere all at once is a movie that works best with a crowd it is a movie that forces you to have that communal film experience because it's just awesome and i hope that we can show it at cult classics you know, someday. It's too soon to do it now. But wouldn't that be fun, though? Wouldn't that be fun? And if you haven't seen it, you really should see it. But I'm going to talk about my 20 favorite films this year. And I'm going to get through those right now. And I will tell you, guys and girls, I do not have a critic -y list. Um, there's a lot of movies this year um, that I feel were designed just to be vehicles for awards consideration. And a lot of them I am not a fan of. A lot of them I am not a fan of. A lot of them I am not a fan of. Okay? And if you're seeing if you're hearing this on YouTube, what I just did is I took a copy of The Whale and The Fablemans and I slammed them on the ground because I don't care for the perils of being a sad fat man, God that speaks well to white white women and like uh, older white men. Oh my God, it's so sad being a fat man. Then the Fablemans, which is largely a saccharine biopic anecdote of the struggles of being a genius filmmaker that just really bothers me because it's such like a sad sack ripoff of cinema parody so there's a scene in this movie where he discovers an affair between his mom and a family friend through film even though it's obvious to anyone watch watching that this was already happening and i get it you live your life through film all right i'm opinionated i'm just going to tell you the fablemans is a movie that tries to celebrate film but doesn't do it in a way that will teach people who aren't in the film scene to get into it cinema paradiso would and did uh, but i will tell you this movie is if you're a spielberg fanboy sure there's lots of them out there nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that at all at all if you love Spielberg, you'll probably love this movie a lot, but you got to realize Spielberg made a lot of movies and he's just not as interesting as this movie tries to make you believe. That's just where it's at. Um, so I'm just going to start and I'm not going to have a lot of critic -y movies on here. I'm going to have stuff that I like. And by that, I mean stuff I would rewatch stuff. I would watch again. Um, because frankly, there's a lot of stuff that came out this year that I probably wouldn't ever watch again. And trust me, I have stacks of screeners of movies that I, you know, oh, check this out. And I'm like, cool, not interested. I mean, sure, I'll watch it. And then all I'll go is lambast how much I didn't care for it. Like Babylon, a movie I care not for it all. Three plus hour mess. It's a 1920s knockoff of Boogie Nights. And it's just impossibly bad. Um, any movie that starts with elephant diarrhea and keeps a fart and shit jokes through the most of the runtime and just 
fuck, man. It made me like La La Land less. I love Whiplash. That movie's immaculate. But, dude, Damien Chazelle, I don't know what's going on with him. This is literally one of the saddest, lamest, most self-indulgent movies I've ever seen in my life. And it's not for Margot Robbie not trying. But, dude, it's like a Boogie Nights, Tarantino, 30, 20s, 30s gangbang that births this piece of shit movie, literally, that just doesn't go anywhere. And it makes me sad that I had to spend three hours watching it. Uh, much like Avatar, The Way of Water, a movie that is over three hours long with the most basic reboot avatar story ever because james cameron over 10 years finally realized unobtainium as a MacGuffin is fucking stupid so he comes up with one that is basically just um there's a stuff that if you poach whales for let's see if i can look it up here on my phone this stuff that you poach whales for, uh, it, it creates perfume, whale perfume. Let me just type that in. And this is part of where I'm going. Ambergris, right? That's what it's called, ambergris. And they would hunt whales for this stuff. Um, and this is what led to a, a huge decline in whale populations up until protections and like the, started to come into the 80s. So in Avatar The Way of Water, there are these space whales, I forget what they're called, tattoons, tattoons, patoons, something along those lines. And people are coming to Pangea to hunt them for this thing called amaranth, which it, they hunt them for, they get it from their glands, it kills them. And these space whales, because what it does is, uh, this amaranth sh shit keeps you from aging. And getting sick. And all I'm going to say is. <laughs> that planet would have been wiped out in a week. It wouldn't. Like not. E I'm not even fucking around. If there was some space shit. That kept people from aging. And stopped illness. And it came from whales in another planet. That population would be wiped out. And you can totally tell why people do this. And like. The thing is. James Cameron doesn't do a good enough job of explaining, you know, he tries to show us, oh man, these are deeply spiritual creatures. I know, because they're just space whales. I get it, because I don't believe in whale hunting, you know, but these are just space whales, right? Um, that, you know, cultural appropriation aside, the story's so basic, like, okay, they're hunting them for amaranth, which is ambergris, which is hunting whales is bad. It's really obvious, and you know how obvious it is? That this was the plot of Star Trek for the voyage home back in the 80s. Star Trek Part 4 did the exact same story as Avatar, The Way of Water. And I had to sit through three hours of Avatar 2, which has amazing immersive 3D, great sound in Dolby Atmos, and the most basic-ass story with Polynesian aliens. That is largely a reboot of Avatar 1 because the MacGuffin had to be something much more relatable than a fake chemical uh, or fake mining thing called uh, unobtainium. It had to be amaranth, which is also ambergris. I get it. I'm not stupid. Maybe people today are dumb, but I will tell you I'm tired of being pandered to by somebody telling me telling me that I'm not smart enough to understand basic shit like conservation. And it's fine because I'm just going on about this on my podcast. This is my attitude towards this on a, a venue where I'm trying to entertain you. So I'm much more actually faux upset than I really am upset about this movie. And I will tell you, I just don't really care for Avatar 2. It's boring. It's a boring movie that I have no desire to ever watch again. I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I've seen Avatar 1. Probably twice. Maybe. I know for sure once. Probably twice. How a movie like this makes a billion dollars, I don't understand. I don't. How Avatar 2 makes a billion dollars 
in like two weeks when it took Avengers Endgame like months to do it. I don't get it. I don't. Maybe you can explain it to me in the comments. What is, is Avatar 2 just more relatable? Is it because the 3D is better? I can believe that. Because it's, it's largely a kid's movie? Probably it. Kids are acting up. Let's take him to Avatar 2. All right, I'm going to stop talking about this. So, I'm going to start with my 20 through 16s of my top 20. All right, so here we go. I'm taking the glasses off. I'm serious here. As I... David Letterman with my pencil. All right, number 20 of movies I enjoyed this year, okay? Here we go. Spirited. I really enjoyed Spirited. This is basically a ripoff or an homage to Scrooge. And it's done with Ryan Reynolds, and it's done with Will Ferrell, and it's done with um, a lovely cast of people who turn in a great movie musical that makes me want to watch this instead of Scrooged. I'll tell you, it was a fun Christmas movie. I enjoyed it. And if we're going to talk about seasonal proximity, I look forward to seeing this movie every year because it's fun. And it points out a really important thing near the end that for movies where people change, consequences have to matter. And I liked that because that's the truth. All right, uh, let's talk about the next movie on my list. Seeing Red, a movie that should have been released in theaters. Um, let me just get this right out of the way here, guys. Disney is desperately needed Bob Iger to come back because Bob Chapek didn't know what the fuck he was doing. Movies like Seeing Red and Encanto needed to be in fucking theaters and they left a lot of money on the table and it was a terribly greedy strategy to save movies for disney plus when theaters are struggling to reopen especially with disney's terrible policy of keeping shit in the vault vault and um not having revival screenings it's really stupid it's really greedy especially with the fox library where there's all these movies that like, would have great followings and develop and maybe make future franchises for them, like, ready or not. But they just sit in a vault because Disney just doesn't want them to be shown out there. And it's super fucking obnoxious. And I will tell you, Seeing Red is a lovely movie that empower a lot of kids. It's super relatable. It has a super cute plot. Would have been all about the awards. And they didn't even push it for any fucking awards this year. It's bullshit. A hundred percent bullshit. Okay, because you should see Seeing Red if you're if you have Disney Plus, check that shit out. Another movie that you should check out if you have Disney Plus that came out this year that's really fucking awesome is Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, which is Who Framed Roger Rabbit for another generation. Uh it's funny, it's clever, it's from the Lonely Island. They did a great job on this. Dude, um, I feel like nobody saw this movie. What the hell, man? You know. So a lot of these are just overlooked movies, but I will tell you, here's another one that's going to be, um, you know, people are going to poke strings. So I've gone, here's, that's, 20 was Spirited, 19 was Seeing Red, 18 was Rescue Rangers, 17 is The Monsters. And you're going to be like, you liked The Monsters? What the fuck is wrong with you? Dude, The Monsters is great. The Monsters is a great fucking movie. Uh, I feel like people wanted this to, where we're like, no, he's going to, Rob Zombie's going to ruin this. He's going to make House of a Thousand Corpses. He's going to make it the Devil's Rejects. No, what he did was he made it this like 60s prequel to the Monsters TV show. Uh, it's super fun. It's lively. It feels like it would be a, a prequel to the Monsters. Uh, it's got great little performances from like Cassandra Peterson. I feel like... Uh, Sherry Moon Zombies, great. Dude, it's such a fun movie. I've watched this movie at least like six or seven times. So much fun. And this is another instance of movie hipsters going, oh, I fucking hate this movie. I'm telling you, in a couple of years, people are going to be turning around on this movie like, oh, why did everybody hate the monsters? It was so good. Dude, it's a really good movie. This is something you need to watch like every Halloween. You can buy a copy of this movie 
at your store at Amazon. Get a copy now. Don't don't fucking wait for Netflix to remove this shit because I I could go to town and tell you how much I fucking hate HBO Max taking Westworld and Made for Love and Raised by Wolves off their fucking service. Uh, I don't trust that shit at all. You know, you need to own things, guys. Own things. Own physical copies of things, you know. All right, so there you go. Uh, here's one that I feel a lot of people probably have not seen. And it's awesome. And it is anime. All my animated films are in this section. Battle of the Super Sons. This movie is fucking awesome. It's a DCU movie. Um, it is 3D cell shaded. It, it looks fucking great. You need to see this movie. It is available on streaming. You can get it on Vudu. You can buy a copy on Amazon. You can buy a copy at Zero Records. Get it. It's good. The villain is Starro. Um, so if you dug the Suicide Squad, you already know what's going on. If you like Harley Quinn on HBO Max, you will love this movie. It's so damn good. Dude, you just need to see this movie. It's great. All right. All right. Here's some more mainstreamy picks. All right. So here we go. Actually, not so much, but here we go. Number 15, The Northman, okay? This is by Robert Eggers, the guy who did The Witch. And it's basically Conan the Barbarian, Conan the Barbarian with Vikings. Um, and then you've got Eric, Eric Northman <laughs> uh, uh, from True Blood. He plays the main Viking here, and he's basically Conan. you got lots of fun shit going on here. If you like the TV show Vikings, you'll like it. If you like The Witch, you'll like it. You want to see Bjork play a pagan witch? Watch it. This is just a good movie. Overall, it's super fun. All right. Here we go. Number 14. Duel. Okay. Riley Stearns directed one of my favorite movies of the past decade. It's called The Art of Self-Defense. Uh, this is not as good, but it is super fun. It starts Karen Gillan, who knows Nebula from Guardians of the Galaxy. And, uh, she plays a woman who tell, is told that she has a terminal illness, right? So what does she do? Uh, she takes uh, the opportunity to have herself cloned. So her that's her gift to her loved ones. But then it turns out she was misdiagnosed. And now it's her and her clone. Everyone likes her clone better. So what's to do? Well, in this world... Uh, if your clone, if you, if you and your clone can't start at the same time, there's a legal process where you battle your clone in a duel to the death. And, uh, let me just tell you, uh, she hires a, a fight instructor played by Aaron Paul. And this movie is super fun. It's a lot of self exploration. You know, the clone's a little better than her. Uh, it is not as good as the art of self defense and the ending is a little iffy. But I will tell you, it's super fun. You should check it out, right? All right, next on the list. This is a uh, Scandinavian movie. It's called Hatching. It came from IFC Films. Uh, this one is about a little girl whose parents are influencers, all right? Or her, her mother's an influencer. Her dad is totally like, you know, whatever. He, he just supports the mom. Um, little girl, she's, you know, the star of part of her mom's little scripted life. And uh, she finds this uh, weird animal that slams itself against her window. She nurses it to help. And at the more she nurses it to help, the more it starts to grow. And it slowly starts to turn into a copy of her. Weird shit abides. And there is a funny weird subtext going on with this movie it's super fun it almost made my top 10 but i will tell you if you see a foreign movie this year this is the one you should see all right here's another one guys now we're on number 12 number 12 my 12th favorite movie this year orphan first kill um let me just tell you this movie is available on streaming only i think it's on peacock um guys this movie's super fun it is way better than it has any right to be um it has a tremendously awesome twist to it that I cannot get over. It's so fucking good. Um, it's cheesy. It's cheesy, but it's super fun. The less you know going into it, the better. But watch it this year. You'll be like, dude, this movie's great. And you'll be like, yeah, Victor told me so on Cold Falling. All right. Uh, number 11, Fresh. This is on Hulu. And it stars um, dude who plays the Winter Soldier. 
You, if you're watching us on video, I'm just pulling this all at the top of my head right now. So sometimes I'm going to get names wrong. Uh, you know, he's going out with this girl. Things seem to be going great. Turns out he runs a um, butchery for rich people who want to eat girls. That's all you need to know. A lot of this movie is just talking and fun and people trying to escape. It's really good. Way better than Raw. Uh, it's a little gory, sure. But super fun. Find that on Hulu. All right, now we're in the top 10, guys. My top 10 favorite movies this year, all right? So let me just tell you. Here's where we're at. Number 10 this year, my favorite movie, is a streaming exclusive. It is on... Paramount Plus, and this movie is called Significant Other. This movie is kind of like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, but imagine the body snatcher takes over this girl's boyfriend and suddenly decides he wants to know what love is like, and he falls in love with the guy's girlfriend, and shenanigans ensue. As Micah Monroe is the girl, she might know her because she was the main girl in It Follows. Uh, she's also in a great movie this year called Watcher. Didn't make my list, but it's really good. Um, check this out if you can. It's really cool. Um, the special effects are great. The boyfriend, um, he is in a bunch of other random stuff. You'll recognize him. Um, he's a great actor. I really dug him a lot. All right. Number nine, Bones and All. Um, if you like Interview with a Vampire, if you like Southern Gothic, boom, this movie's for you. It is also yet another movie on my list about cannibalism. That is at least two movies about cannibalism on my list. There might be three. I think two to three on here. Yeah, for sure. No? Yeah, two. Yeah, cannibalism. Uh, it's treated more like vampirism in this movie, um... But it's cool. It's a lot like Interview with a Vampire. It has this weird, just kind of near-dark vibe. Um, and the score is by uh, Nine Inch Nails. Uh, the villain is played by Mark Rylance, who you might know as the dorky um, video game, guy, video game uh, puzzle guy from Ready Player One. Um, and he's also in Dunkirk. Uh, he plays Barry Keoghan's dad. He's a great actor. He should get nominated for something for this role. I'm sure he probably will. <clears throat> Let me drink some water, guys. Let me tell you. Drink a lot of water. It's important. All right. Number nine. Bodies, bodies, bodies. Go into this cold. It's super fun. I know a lot of people are like, dude, Victor, this list is so schizophrenic. I'm going to tell you guys. All the movies on this list are fun, and that's what's important. Uh, if you don't know anything about this movie, just watch it, and you'll get it. You're either going to love it. It is a love-hate thing, but I will tell you, I think this movie's super fun. It is a movie I've seen multiple times now. I feel like it just gets better and better. Um, I love stuff like this, kind of like Ready or Not, you know, where people kind of get into a situation where they need to turn on each other. It's super fun. All right, number eight is Violent Night. This is going to be a Christmas classic. I'm going to watch this every Christmas. It's super fun. Uh, subverts everything in the best possible way. This is the movie that David Harbour is going to make a franchise out of, possibly. I like it. People who did John Wick uh, did this shit. Also did Atomic Blonde, Nobody. That It's that whole vibe. It's so good. John Leguizamo is great in this. It has so many nods to so many Christmas movies that you don't even expect. The more you watch it, the more you'll see nods to things. It's great. All right, number six, The Black Phone. Uh, this was going to be my favorite horror movie this year until I saw a couple other ones but damn, that came down the line. But it's still super good. Uh, it's so much better. These are from the people who did Sinister and the original Doctor Strange. This is so much better than Multiverse of Madness, which didn't make my list. I'm like, there's no Marvel on this list. It just, this was not a Marvel year. You know, it was all Thor Love and Thunder sucked. Uh, Multiverse of Madness was like super forgettable. I, even if there's a lot of like, you know, little knots to Evil Dead, I'm kind of too old to give a shit about that kind of a thing. But The Black Phone, um, this, this was just a great standalone story. 
Um, I love the kids in this. This was genuinely, like, felt very real to me. Has this whole satanic panic vibe to it. Ethan Hawke plays a great villain. I could just keep going on. I love the mask design by Bacon Jason. Uh, same guy designed Bray Wyatt's mask as the Fiend. Uh, so good. All right, here we go. Number five, Nope. Dude, this movie's great. Uh, and I this is this made me like us more. That's when you know a movie's good. Cause I had hated us for a long time. And like I watched Nope, went back and watched us, and like, you know what? I was a little hard in this movie. Um I don't know. I feel like most people have seen Nope at this time, but I will tell you, um, I went in this movie cold and the whole idea of the 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 villain in this is it's a lot like Jaws without spoiling it. I mean, it's like a lot of this movie is just imagining um, where people's minds are. The actual villain is really a person, you know, and then it's just our flaws and frailties and fears make us the enemy. And then this fucking out of nowhere thing happens. That's just like, what the fuck? And I'm trying to be vague because I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it. But, dude, it's so good. It's got a great, like, little role from Michael Wincott in here that's just, like, awesome. He's just, like, Quint if he was a cinematographer. I just, I really like this movie so much. The whole thing with the monkey. Like, there's a TV show kind of meta thing in here that's actually making fun of Alf. And it's so good. I don't, I can't even get into how much I like this movie. It's really good. It's way better than us. Um, I might, it might even be better than Get Out. Like that's how much I like it. Okay. Uh, number four is let me just say the Batman. Uh, you're like the Batman. I dude, I love Batman. All right, don't don't get me started on how much I love Batman. But dude, I did not go into this movie wanting to be a cheerleader of this movie. All right. I didn't like the design of this costume at first. Like, it just felt like going in from what I knew, I'm like, they're doing like some weird version of Hush. Um, and I just like, I was like, eh, I don't, well, hopefully I like it, dude. I love this movie. It, it got me in the first few minutes. I love the whole like 70s kind of vibe. Making Riddler like the Zodiac Killer was really smart. And then the fact that the whole thing is basically, what if Batman was the crow? I dig it. It's cool. It's my aesthetic. I like, I mean, I hated the fucking Batmobile design in this too. And then you see it in action. Like, you know what? Sometimes you got to let your expectations go. And that's my whole thing with the Batman. I had a lot of expectations and it turned out a lot of them were wrong. And it's a really good movie that touches on a lot of timely things. I don't love the ending of this movie i don't um the whole thing with the no man's land with the blown up bridges I, I i know it's trying to be hush and no man's land and like it's too much i didn't even like when they did no man's land and the dark knight rises like let this this fucking obsession with no man's land go like you know let the dark knight returns obsession go right Overall, though, it's a good movie. Like, the ending is good. I'm just saying the third act has issues. And that's why it's not higher on the list. <clears throat> but other than that, it's a great movie. The best comic book movie that came out this year. All right? There you go. Number three is going to be The Menu, which was my favorite horror movie this year. It's a black comedy. John Leguizamo's second appearance on this list. Um... Again, the less you know, the better. But God, I really like this movie. I saw it in theaters twice. I've seen it four times now. It's super good. It just gets better. It's such a fun movie. <clears throat> it should be on streaming anytime now. But damn, if you, I hope you got a chance to see this in the theater. Because it was just super fun. A super fun movie. Makes fun of foodie culture. Um... Super fucked up revenge movie too. I, there's just go see it. Just go see the menu. All right. We're down to our final two, you guys. And here's what I'm gonna tell you. My number two favorite movie of 2022. You guys saw it in a film festival a year before that. Dinner in America. Go watch Dinner in America. Um, Styles stars Kyle Gallner 
And what I'm going to describe, it might make you not want to watch it. And it's sort of like Ghost World meets Napoleon Dynamite. And you're like, that sounds terrible. No, it's not. It's great. It's a basically, a, or SLC Punk meets um, Ghost World meets, um, yeah, it could even just be that, okay? Um, it's just super fun. It's a fun coming of age love story, very punk rock. <clears throat> you can buy the, the Blu-ray at Dinner in America and get it on Vudu. This movie's great. I feel like it got a lot of cheerleading for a minute and then people forgot it was even there. I'm like, dude, just check this movie out. If I can be a cheerleader for any movie, it is go watch Dinner America. And of course, my number one movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once by the Daniels, the people who did Swiss Army Man, which is also an amazing movie. Uh, this movie should win Best Picture. I want this movie to win because I want more movies like this. Movies that are original, movies that are cool, movies that are different, that take chances, that aren't fucking corny ass biopics, that aren't fucking awards bait. I just want away from this whole Harvey Weinstein, let's make some fucking awards bait movie. Everything Everywhere at Once came out like in February. We're still talking about how good it is in December. Every other awards contender this year came out in fucking November or December. What movie won Best Picture last year? You probably will have to think about that for a minute. You know what it was? It was a movie called Coda that is on Apple Plus, Apple TV Plus. Most of you probably have not seen it. If you live in Arizona, you probably have because uh, the guy who won Best Supporting Actor is from Mesa, okay? But I will tell you right now, most people fucking have not seen it, will not go out of their way to see it. It's a, you know, and it's just, it's a serious topic, sure, something, you know. But what, what one before that? Nomadland. What one before that? Green Book. Like, these are movies people don't go out of their way to watch again. The last movie that won Best Picture that is worth a shit is Parasite, and that came out three fucking years ago. Before that, keep asking me, because I will tell you, dude, that's, it's, Moonlight is not a movie people go out of their way to watch again. I love A24, but it is not a movie I will go out of my way to watch again. Even La La Land, if that had won, I would not go out of my way to watch again. I will go out of my way to watch everything, everywhere, all at once, again, over and over. It's so fucking good. That's what I'll tell you. I'll go out of my way to watch Nope because it's so fucking good. I'll go out of my way to watch The Black Phone because it's so good, right? That's what it's all about, guys. Movies should be things you want to rewatch. They shouldn't be Schindler's List. They shouldn't be fucking Theodore Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Like, oh, that's the greatest novel ever. It's also over 500 pages long. And it's about a, a Russian guy who thinks he's a Superman because he thinks he doesn't have guilt about killing people. But yet the whole book is about him being guilty. A hundred percent, guys. Movies that are good should be rewatchable over and over and over again. You know, sure, some might destroy you emotionally. Like, hey, you know, Saving Private Ryan will make you sad. But guess what? I've probably seen The Godfather at least 30 times. Probably more. Because it's that fucking good. He is that fucking good. Movies you love, you'll want to see over and over and over and over again. That's a fact. That is an absolute fact. You don't want to say your favorite movie something you saw 20 years ago and never watched again. That just means you don't love movies, okay? 100%. That is a fact. Take it to the bank. Cash the check. Buy a house. Build credit on it. Boom. Equity. That's what it's all about. All right? So there you go. Okay? So, now that I'm like in full-on corny Victor mood. But let me just tell you guys, on January 21st, we're doing Mandy. And guys, thank you for supporting Cold Classics this year because guess what? Almost every single one of our screens this year was a sellout. And I will take it to the bank. That is a mark of quality for us. We are an independent-run organization. We had to convince a giant Na national, possibly multinational corporation, but it's the biggest independent movie chain in the nation that we could do 
events at their venue and make them successful. They flew people in from San Francisco and we convince them and we keep convincing them every month. And through sales, through our presentation, and if you don't get it, you haven't been to Cult Classics before, I invite you to check it out. It's a totally great experience. You get awesome silk screen prints like you see behind me. We offer t-shirts, photo opportunities. Um, if you love stuff like Cinematary, uh, that is the that is the bastard child of Cult Classics because we created Terror Tuesday for the Alamo Draft House and uh, Cinematary, while it's its own thing, follows that tradition. So we help create culture through the valley. We support people that do cool stuff in the valley. And you should, if you love Cinematary, you will love Cult Classics. If you love uh, Harkins Tuesday Night Classics, you'll love us even more because we try to make it fun for you and we're just movie fans. We are not we don't are not employed by a company. We just do cool stuff because we love doing it. And you know, it's money out of our pocket that we create to try to create cool experiences for you. And just to put that in perspective, the night before that, on January 20th, we will be doing in a second edition of our Cinema Pantheon event. And if you're wondering what is that? So, there is a cool venue and in downtown Phoenix, in downtown Phoenix on Grand Avenue, it is called Delorio. It is a coffee house that is owned by uh, my friends uh, Mel and Dave. Dave used to be in a really cool band called Prayers. Um, or really, they're an electronic duo. Um, now he has his own band with Mel. It's called Mel Moore, and they created this coffee shop, which has this like basically tiny funeral home, minimalist aesthetic. The whole thing is a black box. And once a month, we just turn it into a little micro cinema. Uh, and we just, it's our ode to making cool experimental stuff for you. We don't, what the movie is doesn't matter. Uh, it, it seats 10 people. We play a, a random movie that fits the mood that night. And we have snacks, we have conversation, and it's awesome. So, uh, and your ticket includes snacks and you can have some of the best coffee in Phoenix, uh, that is vegan. It is awesome. Um, I personally would recommend La Resurrección. It is a great drink. It's got mint, oat milk, orange. So good. Oh, espresso. Tickets for that will be on sale next week. It usually sells out really quick. So, um, it's our goal to spotlight cool venues like Valorio, try to throw some business their way because just like us, they're in an independent, small business. Like we're nomadic. We will set up where our friends have cool venues for us or where we think we can spotlight a cool venue like we do with Landmark Scottsdale Quarter is a great venue that you should check out is the nicest theater in Phoenix by far. It's not a diss on anywhere. You should check it out. I like it more than Camel View, which before that was my favorite venue in Phoenix. Um, but what I will tell you is we also are a small business, you know, cult classics. You know, we set up a Terror Trader every month. If you don't know what Terror Trader is, it's basically a consignment store that is horror themed year round. Uh, we have multiple booths there. So you should check us out because we restock stuff there all the time. I've spent a lot of this week buying cool, unique stuff to put in our booths there. We sell our screen prints there. We sell lots of great stuff. Uh, toys, horror toys, horror art. Check it out, terrortrader.com. It is on is in Chandler. It's at the corner of uh, Alma School and um, Alma School and Elliot is the intersection. So you should totally check that out. Um, but we are doing an event there on February 11th called Sales from the Dark Side 10. And we've done, I think, eight of these and it's super cool. But I think a couple of weeks before that, we're doing another event called Monster Market. And that is going to be at the Thunderbird Lounge. Thunderbird Lounge is in Central Phoenix on um, 7th. And I don't remember the cross streets. You can find them on Facebook and Instagram at Thunderbird Lounge PHX. That's going to run from noon to 6 p.m. We're going to have over 25 vendors, uh, toy vendors, vintage vendors, record vendors, um, art vendors. Um, we're gonna have henna, we're gonna have uh, vintage fashion. Just, it's gonna be cool, different. We're not, it's not a horror market. We do have horror vendors, we have curiosities. 
We have people who do cool taxidermy. We have people who um, uh, just do uh, art screen prints like we do. We have people who do all kinds of stuff. We curate it. It is awesome. It is free to go to. And you can find it, more info on that on Instagram at Cult Classics AZ. At Cult Classics AZ. Um, you can find out info on all that stuff there. So I encourage you to check stuff out. Sorry if I'm a little aggressive, you know, I'm a little hopped up on caffeine and uh, water here. And, you know, I'm just like trying to get the word out. But my whole thing is um, we're going to try to do cool podcasts and stuff like this all the time now. Um, you know, we'll do little ones and then we'll do some long form ones like these because I love cult following. I want to bring you info on us. If you guys have questions, I want to get you guys to get to know our crew um, it is like one in the morning, but hey, you know what? We're fans just like you. This kind of stuff, uh, these events, they happen because we love Phoenix. We love the culture here. We want to create reasons for you to get out of the house and not just like veg out, you know? It's just like be mellow, you know? There's so much cool thing. There's so many cool things that happen here. And you need to get out and check them out because it makes your life richer. Arts and culture are part of a vibrant uh, society, uh, real vibrancy, not that manufactured by multimillionaires or multinational corporations. It's the people who live that create culture. And unfortunately, uh, Phoenix has been hit really hard by gentrification, especially downtown Phoenix, which had such a budding cool art scene and developers came in and saw that destroyed it put up a fake swap meet version of it and there's a lot of stuff if you just get out of the suburbs and i i feel like there's this mentality here where it's like oh i live in a suburb everything will just come to me but if you live in a big city you go to things and that's what we want to do we want to create things you want to go to um, and I, you know, we, there, we have Geekly Phoenix on Facebook where we try to spotlight cool things you should check out that we don't benefit financially from, but I can tell you the things that we benefit from like cult classics, monster market, all these events, uh, are also have other vendors that are kind of the lifeblood of the city that you should get out and be like, dude, this is cool. We should check this out. These people are trying to make a difference in the world you live in the town you live in, the city you live in, and you should support them, support things that make your city cool, things that you say, this is for me. And basically that's what we're gonna try to do here. You know, like, you know, there's a lot of people here who have their little islands, you know, or, and I feel like we just need to connect these things if we can, you know, and it's like, you know, I know you won't see cult classics at like a majestic theater, but you should totally go and check out things like Cinematary. I know you won't see like Monster Market at like, um, you know, uh, in Tucson or not, at least not in the moment, but you should go to Tucson and check out things like Wooly Fern or whatever, because those people are cool. They're our friends. And, you know, that's all I want us to do is kind of come together more and not like be these little islands that are just sort of like, I do this thing and I ignore that this other thing happens. It's like, no, you should go to all these things if you can. If not, you should at least tell your friends about them or share it because then we'll be more likely to create connections between us and be like, hey, I went to this thing. You should go check it out, you know, and I'm trying my best to do that. And sometimes I'm a little tired and, you know, I don't get it out the best way. But I do want you guys to tell me about cool things that you want to see things you do you want to see us talk about on this podcast things that you would like us to share in our newsletters or in our social channels because we have a big social presence and we try to help as many people as we can with that tell people hey if you do an event or something like that you should share it on one of our channels because that's how we grow things here folks that's that's how we become a better city overall so there you go uh, the comeback episode of Cult Falling. Hopefully you liked it and I wasn't a little too aggro, but I will tell you, I just don't like biopics. I don't like award chasing movies and I do like weird shit. So there you go. This episode, what did we learn about? We learned about cult classics. We learned about, um, Italian horror. We learned about Ruggiero Diodato. We learned about my top 20 movies of the year. That's a lot of stuff that we covered in just a little over an hour. 
and I'm a little batty now because I've been talking for an hour straight. So hopefully you enjoy this edition. Next time I'll try to get a, a co-host so it's a little less chatty or maybe a little shorter in length overall. But overall, thank you guys for checking out. You guys are my pals. Love you guys. Want to make this something you want to listen to. So keep this on your feed. And Cult Classics, hey, it's back and my hair is crazy. So I will tell you folks, stay tuned. A new edition is coming soon. Until then, stay spooky, stay culty. Uh, tell me what you want to see on Cult Classics as we continue into the future. And I will talk to you all soon. Peace out, players. And until next time, this is Victor saying, see ya.